Scripture reading of this morning is 1 John 1 through 7. If we walk in the light as, is, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sins. So be it. Something happened this weekend that was unexpected. I know most of you believe in Jesus, but have you ever had him stand at the door of your face and talk to you? I did. <clears throat> God sent three of his disciples to my house on Wednesday. We had a prayer. We had the foot washing. We had the works. Praise God for doing that. <sighs> the next day, I went to the doctor, Court Lane. There was a long way of affair. But when I come home, I got to reading. And in Matthew 18, Verse 20, for four, two or three gather in my name, <laughs> there am I with them. God bless, God bless. Thank you. It's a green light, I think. We got it now? Okay, good. Got me now. Okay. Got to get some water. It's my turn to wiggle up here now. Well, well it's my turn to be nervous. <laughs> it's been a quite a stressful couple months. Uh, first, I had my little problem with my little brain tumor and Praise God, that seems to be under control at this time. And then we had Merle's little situation, which, praise the Lord, that is on its way better now, too. On its way better. What kind of language is that? But anyway, we don't care. We don't care. We're kind of shooting from the hip this morning. Um, of course, we don't have our computer for our songs. I couldn't get my computer to type right, and, and when it typed right, then I'd get a half a page done, and I'd lose the whole thing, and I said, okay, the heck with it. I'm just reading out of the book. So I'm going to kind of go over the reading that we have uh, read this week, and I've picked out some things that I thought was quite appropriate, because I've named this sermon um, Daily Harmony, and it should have been Daily Harmony and Unity, but pretty much means pretty much the same thing. So, reading through this, um, our reading this week, I mean, we were all over the place. Um, for example, we were in Romans, Exodus, Huber, Hebrew, James, Peter, Luke, Daniel, Mark, and Psalms. So, Alan took a good week to be off because he didn't have to cover all that stuff. So, anyway, in Psalms, at the, at the beginning, Christina read Psalms 133. And I had seen a little thing that I was including with my 
little talk that was 133 Psalms also. So I said, you go ahead and read it, and then I'm going to read what I have here that I found. And the theme of Psalms 133 is unity and brotherly love, which unity and harmony, same difference. The psalm praises the goodness and the pleasantness of unity and brotherly love. It is one of the 15 songs of accents which were sung by the pilgrims on their way to Jerusalem. The psalm uses the imagery of oil poured on the head and dew on Mount Zion to illustrate the blessing of harmony. The Jewish people sung one, Psalm 133 to express their joy in coming together for worship at the temple, where God promised to meet them. The psalm imparts blessing and life to God's people, and it proclaims oneness in faith, which when you come right down to it, that's harmony and unity, pretty much. The first one that we had was li live in harmony. And in Romans 12, 16, it says, live, live in harmony with one another. And it is not always the easiest thing to do. We all have tempo, tempers, and um, we all have our opinions, and sometimes they don't always agree with everybody else. But as a Christian, it's our business to do the very best we can. And we are not perfect, and God doesn't expect us to be perfect. He just wants us to try to the very best that we can. And in here, I'm going to read out of the book, like I said, different places and kind of ad lib in between if I feel like it. <laughs> the gospel does not erase our distinctions or our disagreements. In fact, the unity that God's people share in the main thing, the gospel of Christ and the truth of his word, frees us to acknowledge our distinctions and disagreements on a secondary matters. Christian unity does not lie ultimately in our politics, our social status, or what color we think the carpet should be, but in the one whom we know to be the way and the truth and the life. And that comes from John 14, 6. Sadly, churches can be distracted by their disagreements, and Christians can elevate their personal concerns and preferences too highly. Some of us make every issue into one divide, into one to divide over, and so we become legal, legalists splitting hairs, and never happy until we are in a church of one. Some of us find it hard to make any issue one we will stand on, not compromise over, and so we become theological liberals, letting central gospel truth become negotiable. The harmony Paul calls us to contend for is gospel harmony. We need to know ourselves well enough to discern whether we are prone to be legalists or liberals. We need to ask God to grant us, grant us clarity of mind and charity of heart toward our brothers and sisters in Christ. And then we need to take a moment to examine our hearts to see if there is anyone with whom we are not in accord, not in accord and take steps to promote and not corrode the gospel harmony that Christ died to bring into us, us into. Sorry about that. The next uh, day was uh, at home in Christ. Uh, do not be, ha do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. That's Romans 12:16. A home can be a wonderful thing for many of us. Home is where we can be honest, where we're with our family, and where all things, even the flaws, feel familiar. Perhaps most importantly, though, a true home is where we can be ourselves in genuine humility. Such ought to be our experience in the fellowship of God's people. Paul's, for Christ, Paul's call for Christian is not to be haughty, but associate with the low, lowly. It is a way of calling us to treat one another like family in the household of God. Any, any other way to translate the command, associate with the lowly, is to say, be willing to do menial work. Both translations are helpful. We shouldn't be so proud that there are, are either people with whom we won't associate or jobs we refuse to do. In the secular world, responsibility is measured by status, significance, influence, wealth, intellect, and so on. This must not be the case among Christian men and women. Indeed, one of the distinguishing features of God's people should be that characteristics such as materialism, pride, and slander which mark the wider community, community are no longer prevalent. 
And that's really hard to sometimes keep those as so many of the laws, but we can do it because we have God helping us. Jesus is building a church, and the church he's building is the family of God. Our Father is in heaven, our elder brother is reigning, and our brothers and sisters are worshiping with us. Next time you're with your church family, take a step out of your comfort zone and get to know a member of the family you don't normally interact with. Next time you're asked to do a job or take on a role that you would not naturally be drawn to, ask yourself if this is an opportunity to be humble and not haughty. After all, an elder brother did not consider a cross beneath him, and he died there to raise up lowly sinners like you and me. The ground is level beneath his cross, and so his family is to be marked by humble love. The next day was peace that is possible. And I've got most of this all marked in red, so I guess we're going to read it all. The Bible is a wonderfully, wonderfully practical book. Its wisdom is both rich and realistic, and the longer we live, the more meaningful we hear it speaking to our every situation. As we age, many of us realize that our parents were often correct in their warnings and wisdom. And as we walk by the light of God's word, so it will be proven right in time, every time. Paul displays this timeless, realistic wisdom here. On one hand, this sounds simplistic. Just try to be at peace with everyone. It's not difficult to understand, but that is not all he's saying. The instruction is preceded by two qualifications, if possible, and so far as it depends on you. The implication is that there may not always, it may not always be possible. Paul is not providing a loophole here. He's not telling us to be at peace so long as we can control our temper or emotions. But otherwise, we're free to harbor bitterness. His call to us is to ensure that any ongoing conflict in our lives is in spite of us, not because of us. The responsibility for ongoing animosity must never be traceable to reluctance for reconciliation on our part. But even if, if we've done our part, there are two situations in which peace may not be possible. One is when the other party is unwilling to be at peace with us. We may be dealing with someone intent on harming us or with no interest in resolving the conflict. In that situation, it may be possible to change that person or prevent their cruelty, but it will be possible for us not to fight back. When we ensure that we are not contributing to the conflict, we are pursuing peace as far as it depends on us. Our striving, for, our striving for peace and for holiness must not take us in separate directions. The pursuit of peace is not to become the pursuit of peace at any price. Some of us need to take care of that distaste for conflict and confrontation does not lead us to pursue peace at the cost of righteousness. You cannot change your heart but that's the Lord's business. You must not compromise your integrity. That's the Lord's chief concern. But God is giving you an imperative as much as it is up to you that you pursue peace. Do not be need to be prompted by this command to temper your words, change your behavior, or make the first step towards repairing a conflict today. And like I said, all that, that is hard to swallow sometimes. But we can do that. The next day was love in action. And in Romans 12, 19 through 20, it said, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And that, that always uh, kind of threw a question to me when I heard that burning coals on his head. So this kind of explains it a little bit better. The burning coals in this passage are not a metaphor for revenge or pain. Rather, they signify the shame and remorse that individuals feel when, instead of giving them retribution we think they deserve, we show them kindness and generosity. It is the effect caused when Christians treat those who have wronged them in a way that is entirely without malice or vengefulness, and therefore fundamentally supernatural. 
When that happens, the mind of the enemy may be torn in one of two ways. Either our enemy will be softened by kindness, or he will be stung and tormented by the testimony of his conscience. These coals, therefore, are not ultimately being hurt but healing, bring hurt but healing. Our generous actions are to encourage reconciliation, drawing the individual to us, not pushing them from us. It's just like the mercy we received from God when we were still his enemies. If we are honest, though, those are not really the kind of coals we're looking for when we are wronged or hurt. Many of us would be quite happy to find out that coals actually would land on their enemies' heads, burning and scarring them. After all, it's nothing less than they deserve. But this reflects our follow fallenness and not our faith. This does, doesn't look or sound like Jesus. That is what makes these verses so intel incredibly challenging. Our role is to respond to wrongdoing with a spirit of generosity, trusting that God will always judge justly, and therefore we do not need to judge, and indeed we must not do so. That's in Peter, 1 Peter 2.23. Even as members of Christ's body, many of us will uh, still seek to justify our disobedient, retributive, retributive actions uh, or thoughts. Yet while our enemies' minds may be able to cope with our arguments and their spirits will be strong enough to stand against our threats, love and action might bring them to repentance. How does your heart need to be transformed or your actions affected by these verses? Do not duck the challenge of them. Part of growing in Christian life is to look for ways to, good, to do good to your enemies, acting out the overflow of God's radical kindness and gener generosity. That's like the love your neighbor, whether you like them or not. So it's pretty much all that. And on the 30th of June, we had overcoming evil. Whenever, oh, wait, first it's the Romans 12, 21. Do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Whenever we try to defeat evil by our own evil words and deeds, we are consumed. Evil cannot be overcome by a similarly evil force. Evil is doubled rather than negated. If we lose control of ourselves as we engage with an en enemy, then we have been defeated, not by that person, but by the evil one. We are the ones who have been overcome and have lost the opportunity to do what is right in God's eyes. Overcoming evil is a popular notion in our culture. We hear it in songs and motivational slogans. Often the idea is that we can just stand together. We will succeed in defeating the ills that plague us. It's a noble idea, but it lacks the necessary power. We can't overcome evil on our own. It simply won't work. We are more than conquerors only through him who loved us. The power of God by his spirit and his word gives us the enough, enough, enough strength we need to triumph, triumph. This is a path that Jesus took. He did not take vengeance with his own hands, but entrusted himself to the hands of the Father. Christ went to the cross where love triumphs over evil. As we chose to be gentle, do good, and walk the way of the cross, we will experience God's power at work in us to ever overcome evil with the goodness of his love. By his grace, you will overcome all the challenges and injustices of this world someday, and you will meet wrong with right, slights with kindness, and neg negativity with blessing. By his grace, you will overcome evil with good today. And then yesterday's was on, your beha on our behalf. The Israelites, oh wait a minute, got to say the little verse up here. Okay, Exodus 32, 31 through 32. Alas, this people has sinned a great sin. They have made for themselves gods of gold. But now, of you, but now if you will forgive their sin, but if not, please blot me out of your book that you have written. Well, we don't want to get blocked out of that book, that's for sure. The Israel, Israelites hadn't gone far when Moses called up Mount Sinai to meet with God. 
what Moses was called up to meet with God. When Moses was gone longer than expected, though, the people grew impatient and demanded of his brother, Aaron, make us a god who shall go before us. So Aaron told them to take off the rings of gold and bring them to him. And he used that gold to make a golden calf. And they said, these are our gods, O Israel. God had provided them with all they needed for the week work. He would call them to, and instead they abused his gifts to chase after their own ambitions, ambitions and to worship a false god of their own making. We might not make a golden calf, but we are not immune from doing the same thing with what God has graciously given us. And that calf, I read just the other day someplace that that calf was, you think of a golden calf as being a regular sized calf. It was just a tiny little thing because it was only made out of gold rings, so there wasn't a lot of gold available. So it was just a small little thing, but it was still an idol, which is absolutely forgiven, or not forgiven. When Moses returned, he was dismayed at all he observed. Bowing, bowing low to the ground before God, he interceded on behalf of the people, essentially saying, you're the God who has made a covenant with your people. Please keep your covenant. Even though we've taken what you have provided for us and have wasted it in the construction of false, false gods, don't leave us alone. Please don't abandon the work of your hands. Christ intercedes on our behalf and all the promises of God find their yes in him. In other words, God's promises that he will keep his people and complete the good work he has begun in them are utterly fulfilled in Jesus himself. We are prone to wander and prone to leave the God we love. We are those who, who use what God gives to pursue our idols. When we confess our sin to Jesus, we are coming to the one who has already intervened on our behalf. Let his remarkable love for you win your heart back from wandering after idols and come back to using all you have to save the God who gave you all you need. And that kind of concludes the week out of our little reading book, and I hope somebody gets some little blessing out of that. There's a lot to be said in, in this um, this week, and it certainly came at the right time for a lot of people with all their problems and things that have come together and have gotten solved and are, are going to be okay after all. So I just bless everybody for being here, and I thank you so much for putting up with me. I'm not a preacher. I just enjoy doing this, and probably if I was younger, I probably would pursue that, but uh, not at this age. But anyway, um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for our church people. They mean so much to us, and they're there for us whenever they, we need them to pray for us, and believe me, prayers do work. They work marvelously, and that's because of you, Lord. So, Lord, let us go on our way today. Be with everybody that's traveling. Be with those that are sick. And be with everybody that's here on their way home. And to have a wonderful Fourth of July. And remember to celebrate the heroes that fought for our country. Amen. I guess I could stay, just stay up there, huh?